So today we're pleased to host Gina Giuliano from the State University at Albany, who will be sharing about her experience using Zoom and VoiceThread to enhance online and traditional classes. Gina has a PhD in Educational Administration and Policy Studies, a Master of Public Administration, and her Bachelor's of Arts in U.S. History. She's worked for SUNY for over 30 years, including as an administrator at System Administration and as faculty member at the University at Albany, where she currently teaches, advises, and is the social media administrator for the Department of Educational Policy and Leadership. Since 2016, Gina has been an Open SUNY Online Teaching Ambassador. She is also a trustee for the Village of Caston on Hudson where she serves as the grant writer and social media administrator. So on behalf of the Open SUNY team, thank you, Gina, for joining us today and sharing what you know. Thank you, Erin, and also thank you for inviting me to uh, participate, or to present today. Uh, the title of this uh, session is called Enhancing Online and Traditional Classes by Using Zoom and VoiceThread. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not speaking for a second only because I'm having a little trouble advancing the slide. Now let's see what it's gonna do now. You can try using the arrow key or um, hover over the slide. They tend to pop up. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Okay, okay. so um, I say here on this slide that this title is inapt. It's not completely inapt. I am gonna talk about Zoom and VoiceThread, but what I'm also going to talk about is a little bit of the process that I went through to come to where I am now with teaching uh, in, in a blended way. One of the impetus was the physical environment of the classroom. I sometimes get assigned a room on the UAlbany campus that is difficult to teach in. I'm in the School of Education. We're always talking about how we want students to be uh, participants with us, to be partners. We want to be student-centered. We don't want to have all of this uh, professor authority. And yet the rooms that we are on, assigned not infrequently are very structured, hard to move the desks around, very small, not conducive to teamwork, not conducive to sitting in a circle and having a discussion. And so I thought about how could I use technology to replace the teamwork that I was using in my traditional classes, uh, not to replace the teamwork assignment, but to replace the way it was delivered. Then about 10 years ago, I was in an accident and over time, going through the past 10 years, I've had increasing problems with walking. So I used to be the kind of person who walked around the classroom, who focused on people in the back as well as the, the front and the middle, who went to the whiteboard on the side of the room, not just in the front. And now I find myself not able to as easily do that. So again, I started thinking about how could I use technology to make my life easier without decreasing the kind of classes I was teaching. I also wanted to capture student interest uh, as we all know, students are becoming more and more technologically adept. Um, they may not be as adept in things that we as faculty are adept in, but certainly smartphones and laptops and social networking and all of those sorts of things they are completely familiar with. And I wanted to not get lost behind the times and I also wanted to capture their interest by doing something that they were that they liked. We all know they like video. We all know they like uh, technological approaches. I like to push students out of their comfort zone and I do it with assignments. Uh, technology is not an assignment, of course, but it's a, a method of delivery where you can sort of see uh, where, where a student's comfort zones are and try to teach them something in that area. So using Zoom and VoiceThread and then Blackboard, which it could be any uh, CMS, and Ensemble, which is what we use to host uh, streaming media. I use those things to transform my classes, all of them actually, which were basically traditional web enhanced classes. And then on the other end, they were online classes, which I kind of pulled back from being fully online and gave them uh, a synchronous element. All right, I wanna start here with a little bit of history. I mean, I, I feel like this talk right here, I should have a cup of tea and we should be sitting around or grandmother's kitchen table. Um, initially, let's say when I was what I'd say a kid in late high school and early college, I was a skeptic. I didn't like technology. 
uh, and, and that wouldn't just be something you can plug in, but also roads or collective farming or um, uh, wires overhead, airplanes, um, anything that was technology, I was skeptical of and I thought the, the old days probably were better. They didn't hurt the earth so much. Uh, so I was a skeptic. I certainly wasn't embracing computers. Once I was uh, finished with my undergraduate days and I was, uh, let's say, a, pa a paraprofessional and I was starting graduate school, I did, of course, have to, was exposed to personal computer. I was in the office. That was those days when we all took turns sharing a computer. We had to log off and close our work to not interfere with somebody else. Uh, we started to think about getting a home computer. And when I was in the, my first year of graduate school, I discovered that unless I wanted to live in the computer lab and never uh, see my spouse, I was going to have to get a personal computer of my own, which I bought one for quite a lot of money used out of one ad uh, digest, I think. <clears throat> it wasn't a Commodore, but um, it might may as well have been. Then when I was um, actually pursuing my uh, doctoral, doctorate, I was engaged in several experimental distance learning classes where UAlbany attempted to deliver instruction to, at one time, uh, SUNY Oswego and another Hudson Valley Community College. And so we had two cohorts of students, one in each location. I was lucky to be part of the UAlbany cohort because we had the instructor with us. The other cohort of students did not have the instructor and had, I would say, a significantly less satisfying experience. But at any rate, these, in those days, it froze a lot. You had to have a technician sitting with you. Um, the instructor was certainly a, a tremendous newbie and did things like mute the other cohort when he was talking to us, not understanding that that was really harming their learning uh, or standing in a way that the camera was capturing the back of his head, I remember, which was quite amusing. But anyway, we did these, uh, these experiments at UAlbany, which at the time was not called UAlbany, it was called SUNY Albany. Uh, and I, I started to think uh, in, a, in a way less skeptical way about computers, even though I had been using them in my workplace and for my master's program before that, uh, this was the first time I think where I really started to see the power of technology. So I became an early SUNY Learning Network adopter and started to teach an online course in around 2000, a fully online course. Uh, and so from there, I guess I was hooked and I became an early adopter of technology. I was really completely different than I had been uh, as a younger person. So by 2008, I joined a blended learning pilot. Uh, I was already teaching a fully online class, but my, the rest of my classes were traditional web enhanced, which I think at the time was WebCT. I joined the blended learning pilot and I selected with the assistance of the people who was, were running the pilot, uh, my, one of my undergraduate night classes, because at the time I was primarily teaching at night. There were a couple of attributes to that exper experience that made it not what I would say was the most pleasant for me or for the students. In the first place, at that time, UAlbany was not making it explicit in the schedule what the delivery method of the class was. So it didn't say this is a blended learning class and it didn't list any dates outside from the schedule's dates. So students walked in naive. They didn't know what they were getting into. And that almost immediately set a negative tone in the class. All semester, I heard nothing but complaints. Um, every single session, because I basically made a very simple design where one week we were met in the classroom and one week we, ha we did online activities. Every two weeks when I walked into that classroom, I was confronted with complaints, 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 disgruntled students, people raising their hand, uh, nitpicking things like, can't you make that mouse arrow not appear on the screen? Uh, I mean, it was just really, really, really awful. I, it was a very antagonistic experience. And by uh, the middle of the semester, I did a poll of students and I said, if you wanna go back, to a traditional web enhanced class and abandon this blended model, we will do it. To my surprise, the students voted overwhelmingly to stay in the blended class. I don't know whether that was because they enjoyed just skipping a class and doing nothing for a week, which is what I was suspecting they were doing, or if they really were learning something and they were like intrigued to keep it going and to see it out to the end, which may have been possible, I don't know. By the end of the semester, 
I would say that probably the learning outcomes were the same if I, if you, because I te was teaching the same class uh, as either an online class or as an in classroom class. I can't really remember. But anyway, I had a comparison group and the grades distribution was the same and it wasn't different from what I had taught it in the past. So I think the learning outcomes were okay. My evaluations as an instructor were fine. So it didn't end up being a disaster, but I will say that I decided not to do it again because I just hadn't enjoyed all of that complaining myself. So this is where I am now. This is a list of my undergraduate and graduate classes that I'm teaching in either a fully online or a blended fashion. Uh, I'm, I'm not currently, of course, teaching all of these classes. I'm talking about this as being the past couple of years. Um, these are offered in a couple of different ways in terms of when they meet on, on campus, uh, whether they're night classes or whether they're day classes and also whether they're online or um, uh, on campus, web enhanced. All right, I'm not gonna probably talk about every single thing on this slide, but just to give you an idea. In terms of my undergraduate twice a week classes, which is how I am currently only teaching undergraduate, unless it's a fully online class, because I really got away from the night class teaching after, um, after not, not thinking that it was really the best um, schedule for me or for students. So I'm doing twice a week and basically I teach once in the classroom and once over Zoom. Um, so it's a half and half Zoom uh, on campus. Probably over the course of the semester, I reduce seat time. I don't know the exact percentage. Uh, U Albany gives the guideline of 30 to 79 percent. So I would say in this class, these classes where I do one on campus, one over Zoom, I probably go toward the lower end of reducing seat time. So let's say 30 percent reduction of seat time, where we where there would be a week, let's say, where we wouldn't meet or where we wouldn't meet for the Zoom class uh, every like maybe for a couple of weeks. So there is a slight reduction in seat time. I use quite a bit of teamwork, which again was one of the impetuses for me going to a more blended format to get away from the structured classroom, uh, which was harming teamwork. So I do use a lot of teamwork. And at the moment, the way I'm using teamwork is that I'm having students do a major presentation with from anywhere between groups of three and let's say five students where they they get assigned a week so there could be like five weeks out of the semester where it's going to be student teamwork and what they do is they make a major presentation on the one class and they um, develop prompts for a voice thread companion discussion also so that's their responsibility for the teamwork they can choose to present over zoom or in the classroom I would say the majority of the time they choose to present over, over, I'm sorry, in the classroom, they don't choose to present over Zoom. Although every semester I would say there's one brave team that decides to do it over Zoom. For the most part, most students choose the classroom. They also get to choose whether to use VoiceThread or traditional blogs. Uh, my experience is that most students choose to use blogs, but again, there are always a few, student, a few uh, teams who decide to use um, vo uh, VoiceThread instead of a blog. My fully online undergraduate classes, I, at this point, they're completely asynchronous. Uh, I have them only during winter and uh, six week to summer session. The reason I only have a completely asynchronous in those is because there really isn't time. And I just, it just doesn't seem practical uh, to schedule them or to put it in the schedule. But I'm always thinking about how I could add a, a a synchronous element to them because I do think it helps classes to have a little more I think it does help class community to have maybe just a couple of sessions I've always thought about like one on-campus session before the class begins or two during the semester or something or perhaps using zoom instead but it doesn't it just the, being an intensive schedule it just hasn't made it easy for me to do that even though it is my desire and I'm still trying to figure out how to do it and then I have bolded up here undergraduate one time a week, basically because of the dissatisfaction I, I had, I would say, with that blended class and then maybe a couple of classes uh, in other semesters, I have, I'm not doing undergraduate evening teaching anymore. Now, graduate once a week classes in the evening are fine. Uh, and I don't think that would come at any, any surprise to anybody that graduate students like evening classes. They had work during the day. Uh, they don't have a problem with maturity level in terms of doing uh, an evening class. 
Um, so my basic design is we meet once in the classroom and then let's say the following week we meet over Zoom. Uh, it's a lot more flexible than that in reality I, and the syllabus design I have, it, it may not be, you know, every other week. It, it could be a couple of weeks and then a couple of weeks or every so often we have a Zoom class. I don't, I don't really uh, have a rigid schedule here. Uh, the other thing I notice is that when I use Zoom, the classes are never as long as when I meet in the classroom. Like for a Zoom class, an hour long is probably an appropriate amount. I, I can't imagine having hours in, in like two hour long Zoom class, although it's possible. And sometimes I've had uh, Zoom classes where I had multiple student presentations where it was quite a bit longer than an hour. But when I'm the uh, person who's doing the talking, um, or maybe, you know, students aren't talking quite as much as me, I would say an hour long is what we do, or less than an hour. Again, I offer uh, graduate students pre to do presentations throughout the semester, and it follows a, basically the same format as undergraduate. There could be a block of like five weeks in a row where it's student-led. They do presentations. They write prompts for blogs or voice thread. Uh, they can choose Zoom or in the classroom to present. And uh, I would say graduate students have a tendency to more often, not, I wouldn't say more often choose Zoom, but I would say compared to undergraduates, they will, uh, there will be teams of students who opt for Zoom more frequently than undergraduates would. So while I think graduate students also prefer to do their presentations in the classroom, more of them are uh, willing to experiment. Uh, now I also teach fully online graduate uh, classes. Uh, this semester I'm teaching one. And the design I have developed that seems to be working for me and for students is not completely asynchronous anymore. Uh, throughout the semester I have Zoom classes. So this semester, for example, um, we're meeting seven times over Zoom. And the rest of it is fully online. So common to all my classes are that I use VoiceThread discussion. I, several semesters ago, I volunteered for the VoiceThread pilot. I really fell in love with VoiceThread. I think if you talk to anybody who's using VoiceThread, they will be uh, very enthusiastic about it. Um, it's just a wonderful uh, tool to make online learning seem more like on-campus delivery. Um, I think it's effective in web hands class. I think it's effective in a fully online class. I think it's effective in a, a class where you meet um, on, in, the, on the, in the classroom sometimes as a blended class or whatever. I really think VoiceThread ha is wonderful no matter what the delivery method of your class is, but certainly it really enhances online um, discussion. I'm a person that uh, says that camera is optional and I don't myself very often appear on camera. The reason being that I find the camera to be distracting. I, I find myself looking at the camera instead of looking at the, the my PowerPoint or uh, I find myself getting lost in uh, seeing if uh, where my eye contact is and wondering where it is. Are students seeing me look at them? Are they not? Am I looking off to the side? I just don't really, the camera doesn't work for me. Uh, so I, as a result of that, students obviously follow my lead and they, I don't very often get students using cameras. Occasionally I do, but I don't make them use one because I prefer not to use it myself. In the beginning of the semester, I may well do one camera time, just especially for online students so they can see what I look like, but it's not my, I have a great picture <laughs> of myself, so I'm the two-dimensional person there if people are deciding to use cameras. I, sometimes I get teased by other faculty in my department for doing that. I, the microphone is mandatory though because I do like to hear audio. I mean, I allow students to use text if there's a real uh, technical issue or something that they're having uh, so that they don't have to miss a discussion, but I strongly encourage a microphone and that is my preference. And then I have um, ensemble video. I've been using ensemble video in my classes for a couple of semesters. It's uh, the way that UAlbany is hosting uh, video so when I had them convert DVDs and things like that for my classes to streaming media, uh, they host it now on Ensemble. But the way I'm using it mostly is that I record Zoom classes and I put the link up so that students who were absent or students who just want to re-review it, students who have presented over Zoom and they want to critique themselves and hear whether they say I'm um, all the time are, are able to do that. Uh, refresh their memory about a team presentation that they're giving peer assessment for. 
for completely asynchronous classes, although I could record myself using Zoom by myself, let's say, to go over the syllabus or something, uh, because I'm not having synchronous sessions with students, I don't really have a need to host uh, any kinds of recordings on, um, on Ensemble. All right, so these are the lessons learned. Um, I already mentioned that undergraduate one time a week class was more challenging as a blended class. And I, I know it was more than 10 years ago and maybe things would be different today. I don't know, but it, it just left me not really wanting to do it in an undergraduate once a week night class ever again. Uh, but again, those classes are challenging regardless of the delivery method. The fact that UAlbany is now publishing dates in the schedule when students register and they know what the dates are is a good and a bad thing. It's good because students will record them in a calendar uh, because they're kind of written in stone um, because you can certainly expect people to be there. You can plan things, activities that you know that students can are going to be there in a synchronous way. Uh, so it's good for that reason. But there, there is also significant bad about it. And in terms of it, when it's significantly bad, it's that sometimes you have to give the dates for your uh, class so far in advance of the semester that by the time the semester gets there, the dates you gave are not appropriate. Uh, you, you discover you wanted to do an assignment that if you had only had a, one more at some other time, it would have been more effective or that you have a school break somewhere that you maybe you forgot about and it's causing a weird problem with timing because now the two uh, synchronous times are too close together or whatever. I don't know. I've just found that having to specify the dates while it's students I know depend on it and I know that we should do it. It's better than having students be naive or, and not knowing what's going on. Um, I don't know. It, it just causes some problems with design. You can't be as flexible as I would like to do in terms of designing my syllabus. I guess that's putting it in a nutshell. The other thing is on Friday, I had one in my, in my uh, philosophy class. It was Friday afternoon and a team was going to present. And guess what? We had the Halloween storm. Everybody lost electricity. I didn't luckily, but five students in my class did. Two of them were in the team. We couldn't have class, obviously, because of it. Uh, I didn't even have their PowerPoint uh, so that I could have even shown it to students even if they weren't there, um, although I wouldn't have done that. But even if we didn't had no other option for doing something, I couldn't do that because I didn't have their PowerPoint. They had not emailed it to me yet, and the student that had it had no electricity. So um, luckily, we were able to reschedule, but that's a t an example of you know technology fails uh, in a big way. And also the fact that I had to publish the dates in such a, a strict way uh, could have caused a problem where students had to work and they couldn't be there at class. And then uh, blended just doesn't seem to me to be possible, at least not at this point in my intensive winter and summer fully online classes. Although I would like to have at least one synchronous session, it, I just haven't worked out how. A couple of times I may, gave, have given an optional one and like nobody came or like only one person. so. Um, it doesn't really work as well in that, or I haven't been able to make it work as well. You could need two to three weeks in the beginning of the semester to meet in person on campus in the classroom in order to get students ready for the flexible schedule, uh, the uh, Zoom, making the technology work for them, figuring out whether they can do it on their tablet or phone, uh, going over how VoiceThread works, showing it to them so that they can see it in the classroom. Um, this semester I did it on the fly after one day. I mean, I talked to them the first day and I said, you know what, we're gonna just jump in. And it actually did work and I'm really happy and pleased that it did, but honestly, I could have easily pictured that it, there could have been a disaster where I had to uh, go back and revisit. Um, the reason why this is an important thing to bring up, though, is that I know you Albany at this point is with scheduling once again going to making us sort of tell them if we are going to not be meeting in the classroom on a day. So in other words, actually even publishing the dates in like a, a twice a week blended class, I hadn't really had to do that in my daytime undergraduate classes yet. 
I, I only had to do uh, the dates for synchronous classes in my fully online class. So having to do it in my twice a week undergraduate, they didn't ask me for it for the spring either, but having, you know, having to contemplating doing that in maybe the next year or whatever. Um, the reason they want it is because they're going to release the room. They're going to double book rooms if they can. Now, I understand the space constraints that the university has and everything, and I understand why it would be a good idea, but I have to, to be perfectly honest, it's going to cause that same problem with the synchronous dates in a fully online class. I really don't like giving them on the schedule. I like students to find them out on the first day and schedule them in their calendar right then uh, after I've had a lot more time to think about it. So having to do this for the undergraduate is going to be a challenge, I'm going to say, because of that sometimes need in some semesters with students who are incredibly confused to meet in the classroom um, all the time for like two or three weeks. And this goes into saying that the student comfort with the approach increases every semester. I mean, I do remember that, you know, in the olden days, let's say, you know, five years ago, uh, students had a lot more questions, a lot more concerns. There was a lot more problems, a lot more at the end of the semester. Why didn't you do any of this work? And them claiming they weren't able to do it. Their, their device wasn't working. They couldn't get on. They had a virus or, you know, their computer crashed. You got a lot more uh, of those kinds of concerns and questions and complaints and uh, need for explanation and hand-holding than I do today, I would say. There, there's every semester it's, it improves, but still it's less than 100%. And I would say, you know, it's a little bit uneven too, because even though I had a sem this semester, I think students were very, very on top of the technology. It could be that in the spring, that's not going to be the case. So while, while, it in while the student comfort increases uh, every semester, um, maybe every semester is me being a little bit too optimistic. Maybe it's more like every couple of years you notice a pretty big difference and it really has improved. But, you know, there can be variation from semester to semester. Oh, and then recording Zoom is something that is incredibly useful uh, for being able to refer to things that happened in earlier in the semester, for capturing that ephemera that in the classroom you can't capture unless you're in a technology classroom where you're gonna record your lectures and your classes every, every time you meet, uh, you really, we don't have that in the classroom. Uh, in, with Zoom, when you're presenting that way for students, they do have an ability to critique themselves afterward or for other students to do peer assessment and, and have it right in front of them when you do that at the end of the semester after everybody's presentation is over. Uh, it also helps students to be able to review concepts and things from the past. Um, and also, like I said, with absence, I mean, I don't allow students to quote unquote be absent just because they're going to have the class on ensemble, but it does give me a, a more flexibility. And, and sometimes, you know, we all know st there are students with very legitimate issues that sometimes this kind of uh, accommodation is really helpful. And then you have to develop a very high comfort with having your syllabus kind of always be a draft. Over the semester, it becomes more and more of a final, but the whole idea of it being a little bit of a draft in the beginning and having students, you know, again, they, they can be kind of uncomfortable about that because I know students do like to have stuff written in stone sometimes, but having students become comfortable with that and, and having, you know, you yourself become comfortable with the fact that it's always going to be kind of a draft and a moving target. Okay, well, I think that that's all I actually have to say. I mean, I, I try, I'm trying to keep this, um, I, I don't actually even know what time it is, so hopefully I didn't go too long. No, you're good, you're right on time. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Gina, I appreciate your sharing. Um, I don't see any comments in the chat, or excuse me, questions in the chat, but I'm gonna make sure everyone can unmute if anyone would like to take the mic and ask Gina any questions. Or also you can share your own experience too in the chat. Be interesting to, to see other perceptions as well. Um, lots of thank yous though. <laughs> so that's good. As, okay, as you're welcome. You're most welcome. I'm sorry. Yes. I think I should have probably stopped like five minutes before. So no, you're for good. Any questions, but. It's okay. I was taking them throughout the chat too, just in case any came up. But um, this uh, is being, well, was recorded and those recordings are all going to be made available on the same website that you got the information from. So I posted that link in the chat so folks can go back and see that later or be able to share it with their colleagues as well if it's something that um, you're interested in. And 
Gina, are you open to them reaching out to you if they'd like to talk about their experience oh, or maybe they're getting started using this technology? Yes, absolutely. You're, you should feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, yeah. My email is G-G-I-U-L-I-A-N-O at albany.edu. Thank you. Post it in the chat as well. Oh, great. Good, great. Thank you, Erin. Yeah, because it's always nice to have somebody who's uh, gone through it and to really um, talk about how you're intending to use it in the class and get some of those, uh, you know, you've already done some of the stumbling blocks and the lessons learned like you shared. So it's good to have that mentor. All right. Well, just as a wrap up, I appreciate everyone's time and attention today. Additional activities are happening around the globe for National Distance Learning Week, and you can check those out on the USDLA website um, if you are interested. This is an international day uh, to celebrate distance education. And we appreciate your participation. Hope to see you at another distance learning event this week. So thank you again, Gina. I appreciate your time. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you, Erin, and sure. everyone who came.